Hey there friends, Dave Pilatus, k and Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel and an edition of Huck TV. Huck is uh, kind of tired today, but she's been good. She just wants belly rubs and affection. Oh yeah, big stretch, big stretch. So, it's a missing person segment today, and that's exactly what you're going to get. Some uh, interesting cases that I have for you, some letters, and I have an update on the movie trailer. For the people that aren't paying attention, let me catch you up. If you look at the uh, contents of this video, uh, or you look under the comment section the very first comment is going to be from me and it's a pinned comment means the number one comment and in there is going to be the links to our these are very currently lit <laughs> links to our last two movies and a link to the trailer for our latest movie yes we've been working on this diligently for a long time and uh, it's going to come out November 15th. November 12th is going to be the premiere. And it'll be in the Phoenix area. The location has not yet been released. But November 12th is a Saturday. It'll start at 5 p.m. and go to 11 p.m. The links to get a ticket will go up in the next week. And the greatest thing you could do for me is to take the link to our trailer and post it at all your social media sites. That would really help us. And I'm being sincere about that. Of the one thing, if you could just do that, I'd be humbly happy. So, missing 411, the UFO connection. People said, oh my gosh, he's finally, finally making a connection to something, you know. <laughs> be careful what you wish for. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Be careful. So, a couple things. Just recently back from Arizona. I like to promote things that I like. I'm not getting paid to promote this. This isn't, don't, don't worry. Zevia Organic Tea, lemon flavored. It's sweetened with stevia, not sugar. Very healthy. So, I like it. Now, down in Arizona, spoke at MUFON Phoenix this last weekend. Third time I've spoken there in the last six years, seven years. Always a great crowd. Had about 250 people there. It was packed. It was smart, engaged, highly intellectual, great group. Thanks for Stacy, Stacy who runs MUFON Phoenix for inviting us. We had a good time. So, what happened down there? Well, first of all, when you go to these things, you never really know who you're going to run into. And at the ha I usually start talking, and at the halfway point, they ask me to take a break. And one of the people back there walks up an individual that I knew very well, but I was stunned that he knew me. And at first, I'm going to show you the picture that we took. Let's see if you can recognize these two. So, this is a man named John. This is a man named Stan. Recognize him? Well, if you've been following Skinwalker Ranch, you should definitely recognize John. So, they are part of, or they were part of the Navajo Rangers. And who are they? The rangers are responsible for many different areas of enforcement and protection. Some of these areas are responsibility include, but are not limited to cultural resources, forestry, parks, and scenic areas, fish and game, backcountry patrol, all-terrain vehicle patrol, search and rescue, technical rescue, boat operations, mud flow, snow emergencies, wildland, fire investigation, and response. They're essentially law enforcement, but with an expanded area. 
also responsible for livestock inspections. They administer both annual and seasonal permits for rodeo stock, as well as seasonal permits for 4-H. Inspect livestock for resale and assist in the reading of brands for many new livestock owners. In addition to these seemingly normal day-to-day -day tasks, the Rangers have also been involved in a surprisingly large number of paranormal investigations. Although these paranormal cases account for less than 1% of the cases, retired Ranger John Dover, that was John right next to me, still considers them to be a significant part of their job. All their officers are trained at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center and are recognized by federal government as federal officers. Even with their extensive training, nothing prepared them for some of the paranormal cases that they investigate. Dover, along with his partner Stan Milford, have come across reports of several different instances of paranormal activity and sightings such as ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, and even creatures in Navajo folklore like skinwalkers. Well, <laughs> I consider these two guys some of the most credible paranormal investigators you have. And the reason being is that on Navajo property, there was a lot of this going on. And it went on for decades. And they kept quiet about it. They just went about their work, investigating, doing it the right way. And then in the last several years, after they retired, they went out and started to talk about it. And I suppose there's some people that don't believe their stories, don't care. I know what they're saying is true because the way they explained certain elements, I know, happen. And Jonathan has been on uh, the Skinwalker Ranch series, and he just told me he's going to be on the next series, and he talked about portals. And surprisingly, he made an association between portals and Mesa Verde when I did the show Vanished for the History Channel. And uh, it was a very interesting conversation, to say the least. And when I, he was walked backstage to, to meet me, I was stunned because he said, Dave, I've, I've always admired your work and uh, you're doing good things and you're on the right track. I'm thinking, wow, I was, I was humbled that someone like that would come back and talk to me. Anyhow, two of the nicest guys ever, ever. And... Uh, it really, really made a great trip. And then on top of that, a uh, police officer came back who attended the, uh, the speech I was giving and uh, gave me these patches from the jurisdictions that he had worked at in the past. It was a really nice gesture. So to say we met nice people in Arizona was an understatement. <laughs> the only thing with Arizona is it was just so darn hot and uh, but great great times so thank you Arizona let's get into some of the uh, letters here first one is blue orbs hey Dave listening to your video about skinwalkers in the Pentagon volume 2 and at the end you've asked for listeners experience with blue orbs I do have an experience, my only one, and it was an observation at a fair distance with no contact. I, did, I decided to send it in, if anything, to enrich your database. Well, thank you. Experience occurred about three years ago now. I can't specify any specific date, likely 2019, although I do think it happened in midsummer to fall. Time of day was dusk, in fact, almost dark. There was still a thin line of light in the horizon. The location is Kingsburg, Colorado, which is probably, I don't know, I'm going to guess 100 miles northeast of Denver. I parked my car in a safe zone next to some railroad tracks at the edge of a local VFW haul lot. I was facing the tracks as my hobby is to watch trains, and I was waiting for something to pass. From where I was parked, it would be about 30 feet to the train crossing and then another 20 feet beyond to a T intersection where the local county road crossing the tracks ended at the main road through town paralleling the tracks going in an east-west direction. This intersection had stop signs in both directions in the main road, but no stop for inbound traffic from the county road. I've been parked for an hour. 
And with all power completely off of my car, completely silent, simply enjoying the stillness of the evening as well as the gathering of darkness. Traffic on the main road and crossroad was light. No current activity in the VFW lot and the railroad signals indicated nothing coming yet. It was almost dark, I think about 9 p.m. when I noticed the first of what appeared to be headlights of two bicyclists approaching on the main road from the east and coming up to the stop sign on their lane. The lights matched the color of bright bluish white LED headlights. I thought they were helmet mounted due to the apparent height above the ground and that they appeared to bob and gyrate ever so slightly. The entire time they stayed in the same height above the ground and maintained a separation of about two feet from my perspective between them, with one being slightly ahead of the other. I say bicyclists because I had observed people riding through on previous occasions. I quickly noticed something was off when the lights seemed to be moving a bit too fast for being a person on a bike, and the height above the ground also seemed to be a bit too high. My guess is now about eight feet. The lights did not stop at the sign, which I expected them to, had they been riders. I was also expecting that they had been riders. I would hear them talking to each other, but there was only silence. As soon as the lights passed the stop sign, they faded out within a fraction of a second, and that's when I saw there was nothing underneath them, as you would expect to see if someone was on a bike. I do remember distinctly that one of the now unlit unlighted orbs crossed my line of vision in the horizon and against the faint trace of the blue sky still out I could see it as a solid dark circle crossing the gap and bobbing up a bit. That was it and I saw nothing else. From my perspective there was at the closest about 70 feet between my car and them. I estimate the orbs to have been about the size of a softball and more like six inches across. As many have stated they appeared to me to contain a bright, frothy, bubbly, white, bluish substance which emitted the light I saw. Their light was white with a slight blue tint at the center that graduated to electric blue around the circumference of the orb. The entire sighting lasted no more than 20 seconds and I don't think the orbs were aware of me. They may be not aware of you until they blinked off. quickly realized that I had witnessed was not only an everyday occurrence. I stuck, stuck around thinking just in case I might want to see more, but that feeling only lasted five minutes before I called it a night and headed home. Hope this helps you in some way. I've been watching your channel for some time now. When you touched on the subject of orbs, I was quite excited. My son and myself had an experience with a large blue orb that appeared in our house when he was 12 years old. He's 41 now. Okay, here we go. Both of us were sitting in the living room on a weekday afternoon. I was on the sofa facing the opening of the hallway, and he was on the chair facing the same way. I was reading and happened to look over at him and noticed that he was staring in the hallway. I turned my head to the right, and slowly coming into view was a very large blue orb. It was the size of a basketball and was almost a beautiful color of light blue that I've never seen. It made no sound, just floated until it was right in the middle of the living room. The inside of the orb looked like particles of electricity floating around. We just sat and stared at it. After I don't know how long, it seemed to shatter like glass and disappear. We both looked at each other and asked him if he had seen orbs in the house before. He told me not like the one we just saw, but he had seen white ones floating around. When I was 12 years old, my dad and I saw a number of UFOs flying over Portman Bridge in a formation in Burnaby, B.C. My dad worked in aviation, so he was always in tune with what was in the sky. He was the one that noticed him. I've had an awful lot of, I've had a high number of paranormal experiences, and I know my son has too. This is the first time I've put this experience in writing. Thank you for your time. Keep up the good work. I actually know this guy's brother, who's one of my best friends. I've never talked to this brother. So it was interesting to get his email, so I appreciate your writing, and uh, thank you. comes across as very credible. Next letter. Dave, I'm a new subscriber to your YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the village. 
I saw both of your documentary films on television and started looking for you on YouTube. Once I found your videos, I subscribed immediately. I've been keeping up with your newest videos, but also I'm going back to see the older ones to catch up on the topic. Thank you. There's about 350 videos right now on our channel. First of all, I would, people always ask me, oh, Dave, how can I find those? Well, if you're watching a video and you see our little Can-Am logo, click on it, and that'll take you to all the videos. First of all, I'd like to say how sorry I am about your son, Ben's death. You and your family are in my prayers. I'm a retired probation officer and for the years I dealt with all types of mental health issues among the offender base. Thank you for bringing the issue to the forefront and keeping it there. I'm sure we have many, you have helped many by just talking about it. Since watching your YouTube videos, I've learned much about missing people and the circumstances surrounding their disappearances. I also am interested in many of the letters you receive from viewer, viewers concerning their experiences with UFOs and orbs. My own experience occurred in the mid-1960s when as a child and Boy Scout, I was on a camp out with my troop of 12 to 15 other scouts and our adult scout leaders in East Texas woods, a fairly remote area. The region was thickly wooded with a, the exception of a large clearing where we had our tents. We could see above the tree line in a couple of directions. It was a dark night and we had a campfire. All of us were gathered around the fire when suddenly an oval blue orb appeared above the tree line and moved slowly left to right with a slight downward track. It appeared to be at least one half mile away or further and large in size. It had no visible metallic surface but was solid bright blue or turquoise blue and made no sound whatsoever. The orb or UFO had a clearly defined oval shape and for 20 to 30 seconds continued a slow, slightly downward track until it was no longer visible behind the trees. We were all mesmerized by the sight of the thing as none of us had ever seen anything like it. I don't remember any of us being frightened by the experience, probably because it was some distance away. The experience was one of amazement than anything else. I remember feeling a little disappointed when it finally went out of sight and did not return. I wanted to mention one last thing before I close. In two of your older videos, you read letters from a viewer described named John from Scotland or Ireland. He was very eloquent and wrote beautifully about faith in God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He was very encouraging to you and your grief and to all of us who heard you read his written words reflecting his faith. I know that you are bound by confidentiality and cannot forward me John's contact info, but I wanted to ask if you could forward my contact information to him and ask him to contact me. I would also like to correspond by email with John about faith, but can only do so if I can contact, connect with him. I know this is an unusual request, but I was so moved by his two letters that it brought me to tears. Well, hopefully, John, if you're watching right now, post a note under the video that you're watching and address it to this man and if you feel comfortable put your email on there and you can correspond with each other. Thank you Dave for what you do. Your honesty and integrity are so obviously apparent and your work is very meaningful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Next letter. Hey Mr. P, I was just to say that every time you talk about mental health, it fills my heart. I don't understand these people making mean comments. As I've written to you before about my suicide attempt and the fact that you saved my life, I always just wanted to remind you that you are doing God's work. And as with anyone trying to do good, evil will always attack. Please stay strong. Since I've been clean and sober, me and my mom have been reconnecting and I brought up the subject of blue orbs. I thought I remembered seeing one as a kid, but with years of drug abuse, my mind isn't the best. She actually reminded me of two times that this had happened to me with her. The first time was in South Florida at our old house. We had a fenced-in yard, half with a pool and the other half a yard. My room was next to the door that exited to the yard with grass. We had a dog we always let out to the bathroom before bed, but that night our dog went missing. We looked all around but never found her a hole until a hole in the fence or anyway she could have gotten out. I was about 10 and was so upset that most of the night I would just sit back outside the back door waiting for her. At about 3 a.m. I had dozed off with my head in my hands and my elbows and my legs 
and I heard a buzzing sound. I looked up and coming from three houses over, a huge blue orb was traveling down the fence line. It was about 15 feet in the air. As it got closer, all the street lights and my back porch lights went out. I was so scared I literally could not move. I sat there and watched as it passed by going toward the long canal by my house. After it disappeared, I ran inside and told my mom. She thought I dreamt it up and made me go to bed. We never did find her dog. The next time I was about 17, I drove over to a friend's house about three miles away to get her car and go to a car show. She got in and drove away. But when I tried to start my car, it was dead. I mean, it wouldn't even make the clicking sound to turn over, which was weird because I just had it turned off. I called my mom to come give me a jump, and as she was a block away on the phone with me, she said at the same time, what is that? We were both looking at a blue orb about the size of a small car. It was coming from a private airport called Perry Airport heading southeast. As soon as she turned into the road and could see me, we both watched as it went down Miramar Parkway over the turnpike and disappeared. If my mom hadn't seen it at the same time I did, I wouldn't have believed it. Still to this day, we call it our UFO sighting. Of course, no one else had seen it. The last thing. I don't know if this makes any sense. I'm starting to believe nothing does anymore. But I'm starting to think that because of CERN turning on the particle accelerator, that maybe that's what's causing the Mandela effect. I don't believe that a bunch of people believing at one point that someone died and at the next they never did is a fluke. And maybe because of what they're messing with portals they used to close are now not able to. Or maybe it's jumping us from one timeline to another. I also don't believe that COVID just happened, especially when the last time they turned it on was right before the pandemic. They just turned it on again this July, so I hope nothing bad happens. Thank you for all you do. Again, I'm sorry for your loss, and I'm also so grateful for your time. I'm sorry that this email seems a bit jumbled. Getting my thoughts together after using drugs for so long is a challenge this early in recovery. Thanks for talking about Scott on your last video, and I love the video with Bobo. Thanks again. Sending all my love. Well, thank you very much. You know, I've known a lot of people that have been under the influence. Arrested hundreds of them over the years. And I've met several of them uh, that were actually instructors in different schools that uh, I taught in later on as a police officer. And all of them said that as time goes by, their mind got more clear. The reactions got better. So don't give up. Stay the, stay the course. Things will get better with time. You will become sharper. And uh, there's all the incentive you need to stay away from it. You don't need it in life. Trust me. Next letter, I know from that statement, people are going to say, oh, I have such pain, I need it. Well, you got to do what you got to do. Next letter, I tried to brush this incident off as just a case of delirium induced by flashback, but something happened I can't explain. I'm going to post a link to what happened to my father, uncle, blah, 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 so you can see what I remember. Maybe I had experience I wasn't even sure it was a flashback. Took years for me to be comfortable in the woods by myself, but the canyons allowed me to enjoy the outdoors without usually having fear. I was at Eagle Canyon I-70 rest area and wanted to get some pictures of the sunset. From the canyon edge with main parking directly to your back to your face northeast, roughly there's a point 150 yards away, give or take. This is in Utah. If you walk the ravine east away from the canyon, roughly a quarter mile, you can actually cross and get over to that point. The whole area, including the area around the rest stop, is quite open and it's really impossible to lose sight of the rest area. I made my way to the point to get some amazing photos of the sunset. Upon getting ready to leave, I was on the north edge of the point looking out over the canyon. I need to go through my Facebook. I think I was live. I think I was live actually during this. Something ran behind one bush, around another, and out of sight behind a bent. 
It did spook me because I only saw a dark flash, but I wasn't panicking or thinking Bigfoot or some other entity. It just spooked me not knowing what it was. As I crossed the ravine and was climbing up the otherwise rest area, I felt like I was being followed. I didn't see anything definite, but there was a bush that kept catching my attention. The bushes aren't so aren't thick, so lots of light passes through them, except the one that looked full. This started a panic, so I rushed back towards the rest area that is five minutes away. I came over the ridge, saw the lights, and honestly, I didn't run, but I was walking. I just felt that whatever was following me was near. This is when things got bad. I lost the lights. You need to understand, these are real tall lights with the vegetation so spaced it's impossible to lose sight. Worst yet is that the vegetation was no longer spaced. I know how this sounds, but I grew up hunting and fishing. My father always took me out with him because no matter where we went, even some place, places I've never been, I could walk a perimeter and push deer to him. I've never been lost in the woods. I've spooked people with my uncanny sense of direction and even my location from other points in my surroundings. I say this because I got lost in that rest area. I spent 20 minutes trying to find the restroom that was less than 100 feet away. The vegetation was constantly on top of me. When I saw the rest area, after coming up over the ridge, the lights were still on. The sun was still setting. When I got out, it was pitch black. I drive a truck for a living. I drove to the Loves in Green River, and it was the last time I slept near Eagle Canyon. I won't even sleep in the area anymore unless the trucks are already parked. I have since gone back into the canyons, but only at high sun. I will not venture out inside of any structure when sun is setting. I don't know what happened that evening. I've tried to explain it away as delirium brought on by past experience. And this has made me wonder if this is how some people get lost. But at the same time, one fact remains clear. The lights did disappear. You cannot lose sight of those lights. They disappeared. Pretty interesting, huh? Next letter. Hey Dave, I was wanting to write and tell you something I think is very strange. I'm not 100% sure it's true, but I'm definitely checking in to make sure. I live in Asheville, North Carolina on the southern part. The part I live in goes by Arden Skyland area. Our fire department is called Skyland, but we live in Asheville zip code. I live in my grandparents' old house and my mother and her siblings grew up here. My uncle lives across the street from me and he knows everyone. One of the good friends owns land. It's not a huge mountain, but basically the side of a small mountain right behind my land, and he recently put it up for sale. This is what is strange. My uncle swears NASA is wanting to buy his friend's property. The reason they gave me him was so they could grow food for the crew on the spaceships. What? This makes no sense to me at all. It's literally the side of a mountain. I was just wondering what you think of this. Have you ever heard of anything like this before? I'm still checking to make sure it's true, and I'll let you know as soon as I hear. No, never heard that. One of the reasons I think this is so strange is I have heard it at Chimney Rock Park, not far from where I live, has a secret military base under it. There has been UFO sightings around that area and also have had a story about a missing child in Asheville before. I believe you said it was in the 50s. Thank you, my good friend. God bless you. God bless the village. Wow, that is one of the strangest stories I've ever heard about NASA wanting to grow food on the side of a mountain for their people. No, I don't believe that. First of all, if they say they're NASA, they're probably not NASA. And I don't want to see a card. I want to see some ID and I probably want to understand where they work, the people I'm talking to. And what makes that mountain so special? Why want to buy that one? I'd ask. Why not? See what they say. But that's the, uh, that's the letter section. And now we're going to get into the really juice part of the segment. That I want people to pay attention to. Now, people know I grew up in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. And I grew up in Cupertino, 
which was a suburb of San Jose. San Jose is at the very south end of the bay. Well, San Francisco sits in the middle of the bay on the Pacific Coast side, and across the bay is Oakland. And just down a little tiny bit is San Leandro from Oakland. And back in 1909, it was not very populated. But there was a man named Charles Garwood, 35 years old, went missing August 17, 1909. He was a ranch hand at Peterson Ranch in San Leandro. I doubt there's any ranches in San Leandro now, it's all homes. But uh, he was from Illinois and he lived at the ranch for two years. He was described as very diligent, smart, non-drinker, very punctual. Well, he had a hobby of collecting and making things from antiques that he found. And then he would turn around and sell them to a dealer in San Francisco. And he liked to hike along the narrow gauge railroad that went out into the bay and was in the region of what is now Oakland International Airport. So if you've ever flown into Oakland, think about the south end of the airport. So here's the southern region. This is San Leandro right here. This is Oakland International. And this area out in here, if you look at it when you fly over it now, you can actually see roads built out in that area. In the olden days, they used to do a bunch of duck hunting. They still may do, may do it, but I doubt it with the, with the planes out here. But there's also, in the olden times, lots of junk and things that was thrown out here that people would go out and scavenge in this whole area. Well, Charles used to go out there all the time. And when he wasn't on the doing the ranch thing, he used to make good money doing this. And he was considered frugal, very skilled, and very sharp. Well, when he disappeared, right away, the other people on the ranch started looking for him. And they knew where he hung out and what he liked to do. So they followed the narrow gauge railroad out to the shore of the bay and looked around for two days and they eventually called the sheriff. Sheriff came out and they searched for him phenomenally seven days. Back then, that's a long time to be searching for somebody. And they put spotters in areas of canals and sloughs in the bay where there were choke points. In the bay, when the tide goes up, and then when it comes down, you have an outflow of the water that pushes the water back out to the ocean. And so there were people at those choke points looking for whatever they could find. I, I, presumably, they were looking for Charles' body. At 35 years old, he was in excellent health. Uh, everybody said that he didn't get distracted by a lot of things. Um, and there was some innuendo that maybe he had drowned. The problem being is that they never found a body. And after an inordinate search of that area, not finding any tracks, not finding a body, not finding anything, very unusual. Now, if you ask me today, I'd say he was murdered because that area is horribly bad. Lots of, lots of crime, but in 1909, there was probably none. Now, they did a search of his bank account and back in 1909, he had $597 in his bank account. He wasn't in need of anything. He, uh, again, hard worker, worked at the ranch. They, they said he was a great worker. He's from Illinois. Um, there were no duck hunters in that area at the time he disappeared. So it was a real mystery. Now, that case reminds me of several cases that have happened in the Alviso area, uh, about 20 miles south, 25 miles south of San Leandro. Uh, in the northern part of San Jose is a small community called Alviso. It's in the city of San Jose now, it used to be its own community. Well, just northeast of there uh, is the new Santa Clara football stadium, weirdly. Very weirdly, a couple of years ago, a man was attending 
the football game. He said he got lost. And he was talking to people on the phone. He says, well, I'm not sure where I am. And friends, these parking lots around the stadium, it's, I don't know how you would get lost coming out of a stadium going into the parking lot. But he disappeared for a series of days. And he's then found floating in the Alviso Slough, deceased. But that wasn't the first time something like that had happened. From my days as a policeman, I can remember that bodies were found in Alviso under really, really strange and odd circumstances. In that area of the bay, when I saw the San Leandro case, it reminded me of all the rest of the cases that I'd heard about in that area. And it reminds me that uh, of the cases I've written about in my books that involve young, healthy men that disappear and are later found in a body of water deceased. Hard to explain, folks. Very hard. Next case. Two-year-old little girl, Lizzie Irwin, missing July 19th, 1899. Near a big, the closest big town was Stonewall, Alberta. She lived in actually a town called Grasmere, east of Stonewall. She lived on her farm, and on July 19th, her dad was out tilling the field. Her and her brother were playing behind the farmhouse. Mom hadn't seen him for a while, so goes out, finds the brother, a four-year-old named William, and says, hey, where's Lizzie? I don't know. When did you last see her? I don't know. Where did she go? I don't know. Hmm. So mom starts searching. Eventually go, goes and pulls dad out of the field. And then they round up all of the farmers and ranchers within 10 miles. And they get hundreds in there searching. Well, where is this? So... This is the region north of Winnipeg, and uh, this is, this wasn't Alberta. This is in an area about ten miles north of Winnipeg, around a bunch of water. And this area is predominantly ranch and farmland. And for the people who know me, I have. Uh, I have documented many cases in this greater Winnipeg area in the rural area surrounding it. So, search starts. Hundreds of people, everyone drops everything. You gotta support yourself in these areas. The farmers and rangers do. Well, they break up into areas and group's gonna take that farm, I'm gonna take this ranch, and 10 people are gonna take this area. And they start from the inside where she was last seen and they start moving out. And they're calling her name and they're not getting any answers. They're walking the fields, shoulder to shoulder almost, not finding anything, calling her name, trying to get her to respond, nothing. Getting frustrated and they're getting concerned because it gets cool at night up there and they had thunderstorms. Well, at 10 a.m. on July 21st, almost two days after she was last seen, a local farmer named Andy Patterson is walking through a grain field two and a half miles from where she disappeared, and he finds her sitting on the ground, semi-conscious, but alive. She had no shoes on. She disappeared with a hat on. That was gone. She was asked to explain what happened she couldn't explain. She was asked to explain how she got to the area she was in. She couldn't explain. And they made it a point of saying that there weren't any roads around the area where she was found. She was found in the middle of really nowhere. But the disappearance and her ability to move two and a half miles in two days without searchers finding her who were on the scene within hours after she disappeared makes very little sense. And with the number hundreds of people looking for her, calling her name, and her not responding, highly unusual. So that was Lizzie Irwin from Manitoba. Now, the last case 
is a little more intrigue maybe, but it's an area that Angie and I have been to just recently. Uh, a man named, a young man named Guy Ferry, F-E-R-R-Y, and Henry Kramer. Guy was 26, Henry was 23. They went missing September 5th, 1927 in Sisters, Oregon, in the Three Sisters Wilderness. They were both University of Oregon grads. That's where they met each other. They had uh, climbed a lot in the past, were outdoorsmen, and they were climbing on this day, the Three Sisters. People that have followed me before know I've written about people who have disappeared in Three Sisters before, and Three Sisters are three peaks they're in close proximity to one another. So, this is kind of give you some bearings. Bend, Oregon is down in this area. Down in here. This is Mount Bachelor. Southern Sister, right here. North Sister. And they were attempting to climb both of these. They parked their car over in this area. And being very healthy, energetic guys, they took off and the first summit being the North Sister. So, and on this case, I have pictures for you. So there you go. Now, they parked their car at a place called Frog Camp on the Skyline Trail on September 5th. And they took off. They entered the mountains near Linton, Linton Creek. They climbed one peak, the North Sister, and they filled out a little piece of paper and they put a little canister that they had been on top. They're supposed to be home that night. Well, they no-showed. Parents got worried. Tried to call a forest service up at the Three Sisters. They weren't getting through. And so both the parents of the boy, of the young men, were friends as well. And on September 8th, three days later, they arrived on scene and found the, the two young men's car exactly where they parked it. And then they got a hold of the sheriff's office and the forest service. Now this is Deschutes County, Oregon. One of our favorite towns, Bend, Oregon, is a great town. Uh, lots of good food, nice, clean, safe. Got a river that flows through it, it's beautiful. But the boys' dads get there and they say something really bad had happened. Well, they knew it had snowed late the afternoon when the men had disappeared. Well, on September 12th, Four days after the two dads arrived, a search was finally put together and 27 searchers from the Forest Service and the Sheriff and surrounding community went in and it snowed hard that afternoon. On the 13th, a determination was made that they were going to abandon the search temporarily because it was snowing too hard. So it's two days searching when the men disappeared and now on the first day of the SAR. On the 19th of September, 57 searchers went into the Middle Sister area and searched both sides of the state line trail looking for the men. And while they determined that uh, the men had summited either the Middle Sister or the North Sister, and so the focus on the area was between those two areas. Well, on October 4th, the search was still going on, and the University of Oregon actually sent a public thank you to the searchers looking for their graduates. On the 5th, search was terminated because of bad weather and oncoming uh, winter weather. They thought it was useless to go in there and too dangerous. So they waited, and on June 1st, 1928, a massive search of 100 men went in looking for the bodies of Guy and Henry. Didn't find anything. But then, on so June 1st they went in. On September 3rd, 
late in the summer, between the middle and the south sister, Guy Ferry's bones were found in an area that was in plain view, had been searched many times, and they thought that many people in the previous summer would have walked by the spot. But they kept searching, and 63 paces, or about 200 feet away from Guy, was Henry's body. Guy Ferry was face down, hands out to his side. Here's the really weird thing about this, is Henry was wearing Guy's clothing. They surmised that Guy must have died first, and then Henry took his clothes to keep warm. I suppose it's possible. They believe that both young men died of hypothermia, but finding two bodies 200 feet apart is really unusual. There were no witnesses. It was in an area that was previously searched. Henry's body was found right next to a small lake. Weather had inundated the search area and they feel that they got caught between the sisters during that storm. But two men disappearing at the same time, very odd to say the least. Now, don't I believe everything about this? It's a hard thing to believe because in that area between the two sisters, it gets hundreds, it may, maybe thousands of people traveling during the summer. So them not seeing these bodies and these remains really hard to understand. Now, I promise you that I'd be doing a little more research on a few of these cases. This is the case I did a little more research on. Because this happened in Deschutes County, Oregon, where there is so much strange stuff that goes on there. <laughs> let, me, let me read you some of the things I found. November 2013, Deschutes County, 10 miles south of the South Sister. Person said they were driving to outside of Bend. 150 yards up a road, they saw a massive thing take three large steps across the highway. Bipedal, standing upright, dark in color. It was 8 a.m. It was observed by two former hunters. They said that it was larger than any human and it seemed to have hair or fur all over its body. 10 miles south of the sister, okay. That's pretty close. September 2012, Hosmer Lake, three miles south of the south sister. Getting closer. Person was paddle boarding on Hosmer Lake on the far south side, shallow water. Lake was only about a foot deep in that area, crystal clear and they saw large human footprints on the bottom of the lake. They said that they were as big as 18 to 20 inches long, and there were several of them. Well, that's pretty weird. Spring 1976, two miles east of the South Sister, in a place called Tumalo Creek, huge tracks, human-like, flat-footed, seen in dirt. Hmm. Now, this area, it's strange. That's all I can tell you. It's strange. Now, there are cases of people that have disappeared in the Three Sisters area that have never been found, that I've written about. This case is odd, to say the least. So, now let's go on to the second part of the strange stories in this area. 10 miles north of the North Sister, husband and wife find huge tracks and strange hair. One of the people was a logger and had never seen anything like this. They followed the giant human-like tracks to a nearby creek in an area where it appeared that whatever it was had splashed in the water 
and thrown water around the bank. The logger said that the hair was unique and not like any animal he's ever seen. Coarse, thick, very unusual. Okay, that's part one. Part two. How about UFO reports? Sisters, Oregon. A cigar-shaped craft was seen on May 15, 2021 at 10.36 p.m. for four minutes. Long and narrow, illuminated craft flying high and somewhat slowly over Oregon. Four witnesses. Two dads, 40 plus years old, and two sons, 11 years old, camping 10 miles south of Sisters. That's really close. Around 10.36 p.m., my son spotted a very long illuminated craft. Guys, what's that? In the northern sky heading west to east. From our location, it was maybe 30 degrees up from the horizon. We left the campfire and quickly got our phones out to record it. The pics are poor and unfortunately, sorry about that. It was moving slowly and wasn't bright. Knowing that it wasn't an airplane, I flashed it a few times with a green laser just in case it might react. It did not. I believe the craft was moving at a very high altitude. It reminded me of a SpaceX rocket reentry, but wasn't breaking apart. I'm very familiar with stargazing and we had just watched an ISS fly by. And we had also watched Starlink satellites fly over as well. It was very exciting. It was case number one. Case number two, April 5th, 2021, 11 p.m. Bend, Oregon, sphere-shaped object, duration five to eight minutes. The subject emitted other objects, large bright light with smaller lights around it, no sound. So many times I have heard of an object seen in the sky and then all of a sudden other lights start coming from it. I've also heard something up in the sky and then them dumping and it looks like uh, melted metal products falling from it. I've heard both types. Saw a large light in the sky with what looked like smaller craft entering and exiting a mothership. Was pulled off the road with a large number of other drivers and one woman was crying. No sound was made. Interesting. Next case, June 17th, 2017, 10.25 p.m. Bend, Oregon. Shape is a light. Duration, 20 seconds. Characteristics, I was looking at the night sky when a very bright light appeared next to Venus. It started moving south for approximately 10 seconds and then disappeared. Then a second bright light appeared from the same spot where the first light appeared but it started moving west, traveling at the same speed as the first light and for about the same amount of time and then vanished. Strange. Next case, October 1st, 2016, 10 p.m., Bend, Oregon, shape a light, duration 40 minutes. The object changed color. Saw a flickering light that changed colors, white, red, green, blue. It stayed in the same general area but would zigzag and dart occasionally. It also appeared to move closer and fade. When it was closest, it became brilliant and the colors were more apparent. Remember I've talked to you about this before? We see these things a lot here in this valley. And in fact, the, about a week ago, there was one in the northern sky and there was one in the western sky at the same time. And they're very bright, some of the brightest things in the sky and they flicker very rapidly from these different colors. And I've talked to Joe Hauser about them many times and he sees them too and uh, not quite sure what they are. Um, they don't move much, but they do move a little and they are not there every night, which is odd. So, there's my kind of uh, update up close and personal on the Three Sisters outside of uh, Bend, Oregon. If you ever get a chance, get into the area. It's really pretty. Um, there's a lot of really nice lakes in the area. Just a fun place to go and uh, you'll enjoy Bend. So in the meantime, carry a personal locator beacon when you're going out hiking. Tell your friends where you're going. 
since we're coming up on winter now, fall, always, always check the weather before you go out to hike. Don't get caught in the backcountry without the right clothing. And we already had our first snow of the season here last night or the night before up in Glacier at the higher elevations. They got a dusting of it. So now is the season where you can get caught ill prepared and you can pay a big price. Also, the bears that are out right now are scavenging for food, trying to bulk up for the winter. Be careful, carry bear spray if you're in bear territory. And uh, lastly, pass that movie trailer that's under the number one comment on this video. Please put it on all your social media sites. You do me a huge favor. And you will be hearing more uh, about our premier party outside of Phoenix in the next week. It's going to be good. In the meantime, thanks for being here. I'm humbled. Do something nice for anybody in your community. When you're out walking around, see somebody in distress, pull over, help them, hold the door open, do something nice. Make yourself feel better. Make them feel better. And be kind. Everyone's fighting their own battle. Polite us out.